Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February meeting of the Ozaki Radio Club. Nice to see everyone. Hope you are all doing well. Okay, our, our uh, program tonight is Gary Sutcliffe, W9XT, uh, known to uh, many of us for quite some time. Gary is a world-class contester and DXer. And, and a very modest fellow at that too. And uh, in addition, he also knows something about antennas and he's gonna share that with us tonight. Gary, do you wanna take questions during the presentation or do you wanna wait till afterward? We can do it either way. We can take questions during um, or at the end, whatever, okay. whatever you wanna do. Uh, okay, uh, it's uh, up to you, I guess, how you wanna do it. We will have uh, following the meeting, well, I'll, I'll set up a breakout room for the uh, anybody who wants to discuss antennas and uh, Gary uh, will be sticking around. So if you have questions or you just wanna talk uh, about antennas, we can do that. And uh, with that, let's take it over to you, Gary, and I'm going to mute everyone. Let's start here just a second. Okay, we're gonna talk about antenna basics here. Um, we're going to talk about some really basic stuff and probably stuff that a lot of you don't know. We talk about impedance. We're going to talk about some, some of the basic antennas. We'll talk about the height, the effective height on antennas, and talk a little bit about balance and tuners. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of stuff fast, so um, hopefully uh, we won't go too fast. But we're only going to kind of touch the basics, and we'll be jumping around a lot. I started doing this and I really realized this is kind of a lot to be covered. And I was going to talk about transmission lines and I really just, there's no way I can do that in this thing. So I gave a talk on transmission lines. So I was probably 15, 20 years ago at the club. I actually remember, came across it not that long ago was the, the uh, transparency overhead projector types, you know, the clear ones. Uh, and so We'll have to get that updated and maybe do that later this fall if there's an opening. So let's get moving here. Now there's going to be some math shown here. And so be aware. Now, I'm not expecting everybody to follow along with the math. If you understand it, it'll help you understand things a little bit better. If you don't, that's okay too. And I'm, what I'm pointing out is just so you get a feel of if this happens, then this is a the result kind of thing and that's what i want you to learn is just kind of a gut feeling for how things work if, if you aren't uh, following along and i'll have the uh, important points in red okay first thing we're going to talk about is impedance and that's something that we talk about but maybe you aren't real familiar with what it really is you always talk about the impedance of your antenna your impedance of your coax and that sort of thing and that's really important because it, 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 uh, things like SWR are based on the mismatch of impedances. You want to match your impedances if you want to get the maximum power transfer. I mean, the whole idea of putting an antenna up is you want to get the power from the transmitter out, out in the clear and radiated. And so you want the power to get there. Oh, one quick thing. Impedance is made of two parts, is resistance and reactance. Okay, we're probably most familiar with resistance. You have a battery and you know, maybe a resistor and you're gonna have a certain amount of current flow. And you'll probably remember Ohm's law to tell you what the current is if, you're, if you know the, the resistance and the voltage. And or you can rearrange it if you need to, if you don't, if you wanna know what one of the three is, you have the other two. The interesting thing about it, resistance is that energy is lost. So you got a lot of, big battery and a lot of current that resistor is going to get warmer and we're, we're converting energy into heat with the resistive circuits. Now reactive circuit is a little bit different and this only works on AC. The resistance is the same on AC or DC but reactance really only is a is, is a thing of, of AC circuits and RF circuits. And if we've got ideal components, which of course we don't, but if we did, the energy would only be stored and it was not lost. It'll be stored in one part of the cycle and released in the other part. And there's two types of, of reactants. One is inductive, we have a coil, 
and it stores uh, its energy in the cycle by creating a magnetic field, and then that'll collapse and release it back in. A capacitor is made of two parallel metal plates, and it stores its energy by creating an electric field between those two, and then and it'll, it'll charge it up and then it'll discharge. But if these things are ideal components, we won't really lose any energy. Now we use the symbol X to describe reactants. We have X sub L for inductive and X sub C for capacitive. And inductive reactants, we just uh, resist changes to, to current. It tries to avoid quick changes in current and builds up the magnetic field. And the formula for figuring this out, calculating it is, is X sub L is equal to two pi times the frequency times the inductance. X sub L is in ohms. We, we call it ohms, just like resistors, but they're really not the same. Of course, the frequency in hertz and then the inductance and the return. The, we use Henry's. Now, Henry's are actually a very large value, and we probably are using inductors that are like thousands in thousands of a Henry or even a millionth of a, of a Henry. They're pretty small. So the important thing is looking here. So if we've got a given inductor, given coil, two pi is just a number and it's multiplied by the frequency. So as our frequency increases, this gets larger. So that means the higher the frequency, the higher the reactants. And another way to look at it is, inductive circuits will pass low frequencies better than they'll, they'll pass high frequencies. If you wanna filter out some high frequency stuff, you have a, you put an inductor in there. Now capacitors, passive reactants is exactly kind of opposite. And it re resists changes and sudden changes in voltage. And the formula for that is very similar. We have two pi f instead of h. We have c for. Oops, this should be capacitance. Sorry about that. I correct that. Yeah, capacitance in farads. Farads again are very large values, and we don't normally deal with farads. We usually talk in millions or billions of farad in our RF circuits and our in our radios. But it's one over that. So that means. For a given size capacitor, as the frequency gets higher, this number gets it's very large, but it's one over that, so this number actually gets lower. So as we increase the frequency, the capacitor reactances decrease, or we can say that the capacitive circuits pass high frequencies better than low frequencies. So now impedance, if you look up the definition, it says express uh, the opposition to current flow in AC circuit is composed of resistance and reactants. And res so we said reactants can be inductive or capacitive. And we use a symbol Z to, to uh, uh, represent impedance. And it's, there's two parts. There's a resistance plus reactance part. And what we'll do to keep the two straight is we'll put a prefix with a J in front of the, the uh, reactants. Uh, if you remember your high school math, that was usually be an I for the um, imaginary number, the square root of minus one. But in electronics, we got to be different, so we use the symbol J. The thing that's important is inductive reactance is always going to be a positive number. And capacitive reactance is always going to be a negative number. So if we have an inductive circuit, which is a resistor and an inductor, we could say the Z is equal to R, which is here, plus plus J and then the, the inductive reactant. So an example is this circuit might be 50 ohms and our inductor might have a, a reactance of plus 10 ohms. If we have capacitive circuit, we have a resistor and a capacitor. Now it says Z is equal to R, but this is minus J because it's a capacitor. And as an example, we might have the Z is 100 ohms plus a minus J 5 ohm capacitance. But always remember, this is going to depend on the frequency. If we change the frequency, if we go up, well, then this is going to go up. The, the, the reactance here is going to go up, but this is going to go down. So when we talk about a impedance, we really should be talking about a, a specific frequency. Now, let's say we have a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. Well, the X sub L and X sub C are opposite. And when you add those two together here, They'll cancel each other out. So let's have an example. Let's say we have 
a circuit and the resistor is 100 ohms. We have plus J ohms of inductive reactance and minus J of capacitance. Well, minus 5 plus 10 is equal to plus 5. So really what we have is 100 plus J5. And we can say that's an inductive circuit. Why do we know it's inductive? Because J is positive. Now let's say we have some different values. We have Z is equal to 50, a plus J10, and a minus J20. Well, minus 20 plus 10 is, is going to be minus 10. So our circuit's going to be uh, Z is equal to 50 minus J10 ohms. Now what if we have a special case where we have the two are equal but opposite sign? So let's say was, uh, the R is 75. We have plus 10 and minus 10. Well, those two cancel out and it's 75 and it's resistive. It's, it's, only, it's a resistive only circuit. Does anybody know what, that, what that's called? Anybody? Resonance. Resonance, excellent. Okay, let's take a look if we plot this. Now we're not going to not going to look at the we're not going to look at the, um, the the sign. We'll just look at the absolute magnitude. We start at low frequency. Remember, the capacitive is going to be higher reactance at lower frequencies than the inductor. So up here, it's going to be mostly uh, capacitive reactance. But as we get closer, we move forward. It's we get to the point where the X sub C goes down and X sub L goes, goes up. And at some point they're gonna equal each other. Again, we're at, we're at, we're at uh, resonance. And then as we move forward, the inductive reactance is gonna increase over the, the capacitive and the impedance is gonna go up. So have you ever seen a curve that looks like this related antennas? Anybody have an idea what that is, what that looks like? Looks like the uh, two to one SWR plot. Looks exactly. Like it looks like an SWR plot. Because you know, if we have, a say, a dipole or, or something at 50 ohm, it's going to be going to have capacitor reactance and inductive reactance is going to rule on this side. But at some point, those two are going to cancel out and we're going to be left with just the resistor. So our antenna really looks like an RLC circuit to the transmitter. At some frequency, it'll look just resistive, but other frequencies will be inductive or capacitance. And SWR is essentially a, as an indication of how the impedance of your load or your antenna relates to the impedance of your feed line. And if they're the same, we have an SWR one-to-one. -one. So 50 ohm resistive, no no reactants and a 50 ohm uh, coax will have an SWR to one, one. And of course our ham transceivers, they're designed to look for a 50 ohm resistive output. That's what they wanna see, especially for the modern solid state ones. Okay, now a quick quiz here. What happens if you have a wire antenna you put an inductor at some point there? Okay, this is a multiple choice. How many people think it's A? Raise your hand if you think it's A. I see Greg there, okay. We have the resonant frequency goes down. How many people think the resonant frequency goes down? And we see a couple of hands. See the resonant frequency will go up. Anybody say that? Yeah, we see one. The inductor will heat up and catch fire. Yeah, I see, I know we'd have a few people believe that one. Well, the answer is the resonant frequency will go down. What's that? Uh, the inductor catching fire is based on experience for me. Yeah, right. Well, like I said here, answer D may be true if you have too much power. But the resonant frequency goes down. You remember loading coils. Say you've got a, a mobile whip antenna in the back of your car for 40 meters. It might be six, six feet. Well, if it was a quarter wavelength, it would really be 33 feet long. Well, that's not very practical. But you have a 30 foot, three foot whip antenna in the back of your car. So we use a coil on there that makes it electrically look like it's 33 feet, but it, it's, it's really like five or six feet or whatever it is. Okay, another thing is important is the matching here. It's not just because we like low SWRs, which we do, but the maximum power is gonna be transferred 
if your load and your, your, your source have the same impedance and they're both resistive, which means any reactance is canceled out. So um, Zn is equal to Zr, which is equal to R, and in case for a radio, what we use would be 50 ohms plus zero J. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. So in summary on the, uh, on the uh, impedance, an antenna is gonna have a complex impedance of resistive and capacitive and inductive reactants. And that's gonna change with frequency as we tune across the band. And again, we wanna have the maximum power is when the resistive values are equal and our, and our reactances cancel each other out. And then that generally occurs when our antenna is at residence and uh, we only left with the resistive part of the antenna. Okay, well, we're gonna move on now to the, some of the basic antennas. Here's the ones we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. These are the basic antennas. And probably if you have an antenna, you probably have one of these, but there are of course other ones out there. Before we talk about that, we wanna talk a bit about gain because we're always talking about, well, my antenna's got this much gain and it's better because it's got more gain. Well, first of all, nothing in life is free. If we get some gain of our antenna in one direction, it means we're taking away signal from a different direction. There's no, nothing actually created here. We're just kind of uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. And gain is caused because we have electromagnetic waves coming from our antenna and from different uh, directions. And, and we'll talk more about that later. But in some points, these things are in phase. And when they're in phase, the signals add up. If they're out of phase, they cancel each other out. So what are the different sources of waves? Well, if we have something like a Yagi, we, we have a bunch of elements there. Well, each one of those actually is gonna have current flowing through it, generating its own, own waves. And because of the spacing of this, these waves are gonna add up in one direction, meaning the forward direction give us gain and they're going to uh, cancel each other off, off the back. So we're grabbing all the signal off the back and sides and, and moving it one direction. If we have a wire that we're feeding current into and it's more than a half a wavelength, you're gonna have portions. If you look at the current along that wire at certain instances, you're gonna have currents flowing one direction and part of the wire, another part of the wire, the currents are gonna be flowing in the different directions. So they're all gonna be radiating in different, uh, different phases depending which way the current's going, and then they're gonna add up and subtract in different directions. Uh, reflected waves are very important. We'll talk a lot more about this from signals bouncing off the ground. Uh, if you have a big parabolic dish in your, in your backyard for tracking something or a satellite dish, a parabolic dish is, is designed to reflect signals and it's, you know, the curvature is such that all the the waves bouncing off are all gonna add up the same point in the direction to give us gain forward. Or you could have phase verticals, which are fit with different coaxes in a phasing section. And depending on the distance between those and the phasing and how you feed the power, you'll get directivity in some directions at the expense of others. Now when we say my antenna has gain, that's, that's we have to have a reference point because gain is kind of a relative thing. There's two different references that are pretty commonly used for antennas. One is the isotropic antenna or DBI. Isotropic antenna is an imaginary thing. It's a mathematical construct really. But it's a point source where all of the energy radiates equally in all directions like a sphere. But they don't really exist, but I'll, you can probably get some situation where they look pretty close, especially from some larger distance. A lot of times we we'll compare it to a dipole because a dipole has a little bit of gain over, over an isotropic antenna. And we call that DBD. Now, suppose you make antennas, you know, big Aggie antennas, and you want to sell them uh, to people. In your ads, what are you, what are you going to use? Are you going to use DBI or DBD to, to, to talk about your gain of your antenna? You're going to probably talk about DBI because it's about 2.4, so it's going to sound better. But if you're, if you're comparing two antennas for gain, make sure that they're referenced to the same, the same thing. If you have one reference to a dipole and one reference to an isotropic antenna, you're, you're gonna be a little bit confused. 
Okay, talk about the dipole. I realize I should have probably defined. Is everybody familiar with what a wavelength is? If you are, raise your hand. So I just kind of get a feel for that. Everybody, do you want me to talk a little bit about wavelength? I don't have a slide for it. I don't see anybody too excited. Good, everybody's up to speed here. This is a half wavelength uh, wire. It's fed in the center. It's very simple, but it's actually a very efficient antenna. Um, in free space, it's going to have an impedance of about 73 ohms. Well, our systems are 50 ohms, so if we have it in free space, we're going to have an SWR. It's not going to be one to one at resonance. But as you bring it close to the ground, you lower the impedance. And some people bring the antennas in down and make an inverted V, and that, that'll lower the impedance as well. What does this look like in free space? Well, let's say this is our end to the orange part. We're looking at it down from the top and just take a slice. We'll see that the gain is broadside to the to the antenna and off the ends, there's deep null, there's really no signal here. Uh, but if you look at this in free in 3D, this would actually look like a donut with a wire going through here. Now I'm going to be throwing some plots of antennas at different situations. And I'm using a program called Easy Neck. I've been using this for like 25 or 30 years. It was written by Roy Luall and W7EL. Now he recently retired and he released it for free, but there's no support. And if you go to this website here, you can down there. It's just a bit of a learning curve to use this one. I think there's some simpler ones, but it's a very good program. Um, I was always using the, the, the hobby version, which is I think like 75 or hundred dollars. And but now I'm this is what I'm using the pro version because it's free. So if you're interested in modeling antennas, this is, this is a good program. So we talked about effects of antennas at height. Well, if we have an antenna, some of the signal is going to go off at an angle in the space, but some of it's going to hit the ground and bounce back. And those signals are going to combine. Some areas are going to add and some areas are going to subtract. So the antenna pattern we can expect, uh, expect in our backyard is going to be different than one that you'd see in a free space. If we put the dipole at a half quarter wavelength, we can see that a lot of the signal goes up pretty high. And so this is a good antenna. Maybe if you want to talk to people, you know, in nearby states, you know, if you're, you know, some net that you get into or talk to some friends every day or whatever, you know, a, a dipole, a lower dipole can be pretty useful for that. But as you see, as we raise this up, the, the curves change. And as a general trend, as the higher you go, the, the lower the angle of the main load, uh, lobe. And as you go up, you start getting more of these lobes. I probably should have shown a few more pictures if we'd gone up higher, but you start getting, in some antennas, you'll get multiple lobes at, at, at uh, different angles. So if I want to talk to my friends down in northern Illinois, this might be a good antenna to quarter wavelength. But if I wanted to talk to DX in the, you know Europe or maybe even California or Hawaii, I might want my dipole up you know a wavelength or maybe even two wavelengths. So who you talk to uh, is going to depend on your antenna height. Another common antenna is a quarter wave vertical, and it's sort of like the dipole except we have the the wires vertical, but instead of um, the wire going in the ground, the ground is essentially the other half of the dipole, but grounds are real soil is not a very good conductor. So we want to improve that with radials. And uh, like I said, it's a quarter wavelength. We have a very good ground system. The impedance is going to be about 35 ohms. Well, that's pretty low. Well, some guys make a mistake. They put up a vertical. They put in a few radials and they, they check the SWR and the SWR is one to one. So, oh, great, my antenna is working really well. You got a one to one SWR, so I'm not going to go to the trouble to put any more radials in. Well, they're actually making a mistake because it means the ground is not very good and you get ground losses. So, essentially, it's like putting, if it was one to one, it'd be like putting a 15 ohm resistor here. And all you're really doing is heating up the ground. Now, the earthworms might like it this time of the year, but you're not getting signals radiated into space. So you really want to put in, in a good radio system. We were talking a little about that earlier tonight. Um, so, and that's a case where a good SWR may may not, perfect SWR may not be good. And it has a Excuse little me, bit Gary. of gain. 
Yeah. Uh, how deep do you have to put the radials? Uh, you can go around the ground. I mean, you probably probably don't want to bury them too deep because then the the, the soil will kind of kind of isolate them. I when I put them up, I just generally either put a, a slit right in the ground, like a you know a half an inch or an inch, or I'll lay them down and I'll I'll put some some like lawn staples on, let the grass grow over them. So um, you can also elevate them, and that's a whole different topic. And then you don't need as many, but um, they need to be resident. And and then there's other practical, you know, uh, practical things you have to deal with as well. But just lay them on the ground. That's fine. If you do it like uh, cut the grass and put them down and you know, in a few weeks, if your grass is growing well, you probably won't have a problem. Or you can slit trench them in with like a, an edge or, or something like that. And this is um, what the pattern looks like. You don't have anything up going up straight, so this is not good for talking to to uh, your your friends in nearby states. And it's a fairly low angle, uh, takeoff angle, so it's often a good DX antenna. Then we have the Yagi. This is actually a lot more complex than the other ones, but it's also high performance because it's got more gain. And this is made of multiple elements. We start with the driven element, and essentially it's a it's a dipole, about a half wavelength. And the elements are spaced, it, it varies depending on the sign, but around 0.2 or, or a quarter wavelength apart. You'll have a reflector, which is longer. And then you, you you know if you have a two element Yagi, it'll probably be a reflector and driven element. And if you have a three element, then you'll have a director. And then if you get in the VHF, you get more and more directors. You might have a really long boom VHF that might have 15 or 20 directors. And each one gets a little bit smaller as they go through. Now the gain's gonna vary on the number of elements and the spacing and whatever. Now the impedance of these things are generally 50 ohm, but they're changed with some tuning things. Because if we just built a dipole here, the impedance will not be 50 ohms. So there'll be like a gamma match or a beta max. And there's another way sometimes we'll take the first director and move it very close here to uh, reduce it to 50 ohms. But as current flows through the driven uh, element, you'll give off an electromagnetic wave, which will induce currents in the other uh, conductors, and though they will re-radiate them because of the spacing, we will get the, a pattern that adds up that looks something like this. If we were looking at this from the end, the end points of the Yagi in free space, we can see that it's it's mostly going forward. Um, there won't be any gain coming towards us or against us because that's off the end. But we don't live in space. So what does this look like if we have one of these things in our backyard? Well, if we have that half wavelength, we see we got a kind of a big lobe here and it's at a pretty high takeoff angle. If we move it up to a full wave, we see that the we see that the the, the lobe goes lower and, and the other minor lobes start becoming more well formed. We go two wavelengths, we see the main lobe split into two. The main one is, is even lower than the other ones. And if we go up higher and higher, we'll start getting multiple lobes and then the back ones will also be here. And so we're gonna have some, some holes. The signal's coming in at this angle or coming in at that angle, that's pretty good. But if it's coming in at this angle, it's not so good. So there'll be times when the signals are not gonna be working out all that well for us. And so if you're a really big gun, you have a big taller tower and you have a bunch of these things at, at various heights and they'll, the lobes will start filling in. And so we'll fill in the gaps with having a bunch of, of these things stacked above each other. So a quick comparison, the dipole is pretty simple. It's efficient, it's a simple support and it's patterns we depend on the uh, height. And if it's low, it's gonna be good for, for local QSOs. Vertical is simple, does require a, a good radio system. Uh, it has a reasonably good low takeoff angle for DX, especially at the low bands because, you know, it's pretty difficult to make a Yagi for 80 or 160 meters. That's not how many people 
have, have done that and the few that have usually only going to keep them up for less than a year so um a, a vertical is a very good engine if you want to work dx on the low band so if you've got a good radio system yagi is more complex but we do get the performance and the, and again uh it depends on on the height uh for the pattern so there's a lot of other types of antennas and all of them are going to have some advantages and disadvantages Okay, next question. What is the worst type of an antenna? Anyone? Dummy load. Dummy load. Dummy load? One that's sitting in your garage and not hooked up to anything. That's the right answer. Oh. <laughs> the one that's not put up. Um, there's actually people that have, I've actually heard people using your dummy load across town. So, and I, uh, and there's actually some guy in California who operated a contest using a light bulb, which used to be, used commonly in the past as a dummy load. And then he worked a bunch of guys and then he decided he needed more gain. So he used two dummy, two light bulbs and he, he phased them. So put up the best antenna that you can and make contacts is my advice. Now, we talked about antennas over flat ground. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely do not live in a flat area. Um, there's a program called HFTA by Dean Straw N6BV. And if you get a copy of the ARL antenna book, uh, the old days had a CD that had the program on there. Otherwise, if you buy a new one, you get a code and you can download this program. And you can get uh, train data for your QTH from the uh, US Geological Survey. And this is a model for my, my, my uh, antenna for 20 meters into Europe. Now, I live up on top of a hill or just about 1100 feet and, and the, you know, this was a, a hill that was kind of flattened out, I guess, to make it flat for the house. And I've got a, a tower. So here's the base of the tower and here's my antenna, but it drops off real, real steep here because of, you know, the, it's the hill that we're on. And then we go further, it's pretty flat, slopes a little bit and we get to a point where there's a lake and we get to the other side of the lake and then it starts building up. And if you get about two miles away, you know, the hill is actually higher than my antenna. Well, it's actually pretty good. It's not perfect. I'd, I'd really prefer if this thing just sloped gently like this, but this is the best I've got. So let's take a look at my uh, thing. I'm using a four element Yagi, which is pretty close to what my TH7 is on 20 meters. And the blue line here is the, the curve of the main lobe here on flat ground. Now, remember the lobes we had with the um, with the Yagi before when they were horizontal. Just kind of imagine that these things are, are rotated at 90 degrees. Well, the red one is actually mine at um, over the real terrain. And you can see that you know it peaks quite a bit lower lower than um, the one on flat ground. Well, that's because it's higher because you know, I get, this, my tower is effectively a little bit taller because it's it slopes off so quickly here. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to click. But it's pretty bumpy because, you know, the train isn't, 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 uh, isn't flat. So how does this help us? Well, down here, this is the statistical probability that if the band is open to Europe on 20 meters, that the signal is going to be coming in at this angle. So if you look at this big one here, it's nine degrees. We go over, there's about 11% chance that that's the signal that I'm hearing if the band is open. Now, these spikes here are all based over an entire uh, solar cycle. So good conditions, bad conditions, and this is what you'd expect if you looked at every day for a, for a cycle or several cycles or whatever. But they're gonna actually be skewed in real life. If we're at the low part of the sunspot cycle or we're just the band's just starting to open, we'll probably be more at the lower angle takeoff angles. Or if the peak of the opening in a high sunspot uh, period of time, then, then the, uh, the it's most likely going to be coming in at a higher angle. 
just kind of give us a long term what 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 we could expect and we'd obviously want to cover as many as possible so you can see that there's some high probabilities here and especially in this slow part of the sunspots like we've been living through the last four or five uh, years that my yagi is actually going to be a lot better you know in some cases like well we've got nine well, let's say right here about six db something i get almost 10 or 11 db if the signal is coming in this over over if, if it was a little done flat ground so in this case living on this hill here really helps a lot but not often some of you guys know i've been trying to work dxcc on six meters and during this the spring and summer months, we get something called sporadic E, and these little E layer openings up, and we'll get these these openings hops for maybe oh, about uh, maybe 12, 1400 miles. But sometimes we'll get a bunch of these things lined up, and we can work into Europe. And Kenny likes to call these like a bunch of cue balls that if they, and your signal just bounces off in a, in a complex combination shot, or maybe a frog jumping across and a bunch of lily pads across the pond. Well, we found that there's actually openings in Japan a few times a year. We didn't even know about this opening until maybe 10 years ago. But um, with FT8 and stuff, we've, it's actually, we find we can use it quite a bit. Well, I've been trying to work, work uh, Japan for several years. And I'd hear them, I'd be calling, and then, then they'd talk to Kenny, W9GA, or... Well, you mean when I would, would fill half a log sheet with... Yeah, uh, or Gary, Kenny, DJT. Yeah, I worked a dozen, and then Kenny said, I worked 25, and I struggled <laughs> for three years and got nothing. Well, one yeah, of the guys... I didn't said, work uh, HL either. Yeah, I haven't worked any of that stuff. <laughs> so one of the guys suggested, well, why don't you do an, an HFTA uh, analysis? on six meters. Well, this is my train plot looking towards Japan. You have the hill and it drops off really steep, but then it goes up really fast. And then big drop off and then about a mile or so away, it's another peak and it drops off and goes up. This is a really terrible plot for, for, uh, for what I'm trying to do here. So let's look at what this pattern would be um if it's on flat ground well because it's more than a you know it's multiple wavelengths high we get this nice smooth we get these curves but because i have this terrible direction here i read i got this thing and then a big deep dive here and then it comes up here well on 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 six meters most of our signals are on e on sporadic e are going to be under 15 degrees and my guess is that we were getting all these openings and the signals were coming in down around here. I got this really bad null and Ken and Gary are sitting there on a, with a much better, a lot more gain. And they're working in Japan and I'm just sitting there pounding my head against the wall with no luck. So I started getting desperate and I thought, well, what, what if I did something else? I played around did some modeling as so well. If, if I put a dipole up at 30 feet, I get this green line. And that's going to be a whole lot better at these lower angles than, than, uh, than my engine, and maybe even in, around here, even in the non-flat land. Well, I was, got one built in, was headed up, and then we got one night, and we got an opening, and it must have come in a different angle because I worked a dozen JAs that night, so I never didn't get around to getting the dipole up. But I, I'm going to do something to catch those HLs in Korea and, and maybe Japan. But you can see... In this particular case, a dipole at 30 feet would outperform a three element Yagi at 55 feet. Who would have thought? But terrain can make a big difference. So high antennas are usually better, but not always. Okay, next quiz. Here's a piece of coax, RG8X, and a PL259. How many connectors are present on this? Uh, coax connector. Raise your hand if you think it's one. How many people think it's two? Hands go up. How many people think it's three? Let's see one. A couple of hands go up. How many people think it's four? Nobody thinks it's four. 
The correct answer is three. Uh, it doesn't sound right, but it's true. You have the center conductor. You have the inside of the shield is what you want it. But unfortunately, sometimes you get current on the outside of the shield. Now you don't want that, but it happens. And that introduces to balance and RF chokes. Okay, let's say we got a dipole here and it's a balanced antenna and our coax is unbalanced. And if we look at the current at any given time, we're gonna have current coming up to the center conductor going this way. We're gonna have current flowing and ideally, it flows through the inside, and it's going to be in the opposite direction, of course, but it's also going to be exactly the same amount, in which case the magnetic fields from these two would cancel, and this, then the signal would be contained in the coax. But because it's not perfectly balanced, some of it's going to flow on the outside. And whenever you have RF floating on a conductor, you have an antenna. And so this is going to radiate. And remember what happens when you have multiple wave fronts, they interact. Some places they're gonna add up and some places are gonna distract the track. So you're gonna mess up your pattern, which may or may not be a good thing, but you can also get RFI in the shack. And so generally we don't want this to happen. Well, the first thing we can do is use a balance, which is short for balance, unbalance, not Balin, it's Balin. And here's a couple of commercial ones that I have laying around. What these things generally are is you have a coax connector at one end and you have connectors for your, your antenna. You have a ferrite rod and you have, you have wires wound around to form a transformer and that takes your unbalanced antenna and, or your unbalanced coax and balances it for the match to the, to the, uh, to the antenna. Or we can use uh, uh, an RF choke. And an RF choke, place the high impedance. Remember what impedance is? Who can tell me what impedance is? Anybody tell me what impedance? We talked about that earlier. What does impedance do? It, 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 it uh, impedes current flow. So one kind of way of doing that is just an RF choke with coax. And since we've got a big inductor here, inductor has um, resists flow. Now it's a little more complex because we have these windings and you're gonna have capacitance between the windings. So you're gonna actually have an, an LC circuit here. And so if you aren't careful, it's gonna have a resonance and depending where that resonance is, it may, your, your choke may not be very, uh, very effective. Another way is to put a ferrite on your, on your coax, ferrite beads. Now we just show one here, it's a clamp on one, but they make ones that fit over coax if you put it on, if we put the connector on. And usually you're gonna need a lot, you know, at higher frequencies, maybe get by with half a dozen or so, you get down to the low ones, depending on the mix and the size and whatnot, you might need 20 or more to act as an RF choke. Another thing is you can take a ferrite core and you can wrap the coax around several times. And nice thing about this is that the impedance uh, increases with the square of the number of turns. You double the number of turns and you get four times the impedance. So that's what's one of the nice things about that. But the RF choke will prevent or at least reduce the amount of current flowing through the outside of your coax. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about antenna tuners. Well, first of all, they don't tune the antenna. I don't know why they came with that name, but they don't tune the antenna. Let's take a look at your typical uh, system. Now we're gonna assume we have an external tuner, just to, for example, here we have a transmitter. And remember what our transmitter wants to see, 50 ohms resistive and no, no uh, reactants. We have our tuner and we're using 50 ohm coax here. We have another piece of coax going to our antenna. Now we, if our antenna was perfectly flat and resistive, we would need a tuner, but we have the tuner because we know at some frequencies we want to use that. Maybe we want to use our, use our, our dipole at a different band than it's designed for. Uh, I, use, I use my uh, 40 meter beam on 12 and 17 meters through, through a tuner. It works quite well. But the impedance is not 50 plus J ohms, with J meaning we have zero J means we have no reactants. 
it could be anywhere within you know within reason we don't know what that is but there's another thing in play and that's that coax if you have a load is a different impedance than the coax the impedance that's here is not necessarily the impedance you're going to see here this something we'll talk about when i have my talk on coax lines if i get around to doing that but it could change even if you put a resistor here like instead of a 50 ohm let's say we put a a 200 ohm resistor here depending on the length here this might look like a resistor of a different value it might look like a capacitor it might look like an inductor most likely it'll look like a resistor of some value and then some sort of impedance either capacitive or inductive of something else and it's going to be 10 on the mismatch and the length of coax so as far as we're concerned this this impedance at the at the output of your tuner could be just about anything we need to transfer this to 50 ohms with no reactants. Remember, that's where we get the best power transfer and SWR is one to one. So the tuner, what it does is it takes this, whatever this reactance is, and it, if it's inductive, it, it basically tunes it out with capacitance to cancel the reactance and changes the resistance and everything and reactance to 50 ohms. So we have 50 ohms here, 50 ohm coax, nice and flat line. The transmitter sees 50 ohms and it's happy. But it does not tune the antenna. That's the important thing. So is that OK? Well, yeah, yes and no. Because at this point, we have a big mismatch, the coax. We can have a very high SWR here. And the transmitter is happy. because It sees 50 ohm, but the SWR is, is high here. Is that bad? Well, it can be. If we have some high losses here, and this is a long line, the SWR is going to increase the amount of loss on that line. So let's say you have a long run of coax, it's got 3 dB. If your SWR is up around, you know, five or so, you might lose half your power. And if this thing's way off from 50 ohms, the SWR here can be quite high. So ideally, you have your tuner next to the antenna as possible. So this coax is a short and minimize the loss. But of course, that's not very practical. And most of us, most of us have the tuner inside and maybe even inside the radio. So you want to use, if you're using a tuner, you want to use good coax that has low loss and try to keep the, the lengths low. So in summary, we want our antenna to be 50 ohms resistance with no reactants to match our transmitter. But you have to remember this changes with frequency. Now, the best antennas depend on a lot of factors, who you want to contact, how much space and what your budget is. As we saw, a terrain can be very important. And maybe most importantly, that it's up in the air. It's not in your garage. Now, getting the antenna up higher generally improves performance, but not always, as we saw. Uh, Currents flowing on the uh, coax outer shield will alter the pattern. So you want to try to minimize that. And the tuner just makes things look nice for the transmitter, but it doesn't really do anything for the SWR and the coax past it. And if, if there is a high SWR and high losses, you, you will lose power in your coax, be warming it up. And again, it does not tune the antenna. So that's it. Does anybody have any questions? I've got a question on uh, free space impedance. Yes. So if the free space impedance is 366 ohms, wouldn't we want to have a, an antenna that uh, it matches that impedance uh, and realizing then that uh, we'd have to modify the transmission line and the transmitter, but that's always been a question in my mind. If the antenna, if the um, free space impedance is 366 ohms, why isn't stuff built to that? That's a good question. I don't know. Kenny, do you know the answer to that? You're more of an RF guy than I am. Well, I'm not sure I can explain it. Um, yeah, free space is 300 and what is it? Uh, 366 or whatever. Six, yeah. 
but you're not actually trying to match to that impedance. I think you're just basically trying to get the maximum amount of current to flow on the antenna to, to radiate into that impedance. Uh, if the antenna is lower in impedance, it'll tend to drive that free space. Whereas if the antenna was way too high in impedance, you would lose, you would actually lose signals due to some kind of a matching loss with the ionosphere. But I don't think that really enters into it too much. Um, that's an interesting question. Yeah, you kind of th that, that threw me for a curve there. But, <laughs> and I've seen That's the explanation. Kind of a theoretical I, thing. <laughs> I could haul out one of my engineering books and find the answer, but we, I don't have half an hour to look through it. <laughs> well, you know, the 300 ohm twin lead line would kind of match close to that um, uh, free space antenna more than the 50. Maybe the problem is transmitters are wanting to see a lower impedance. Uh, I don't know. No, you can design them. You can design them, and 50 ohms is kind of a compromise impedance. I mean, coax they they when they invented it, um, they, they made 75 ohm coax, and, they, and there's even 100 ohm coax and 35 ohm coax. And if you if you notice, like you have cable TV, you have 75 ohms. The higher impedance has because the construction is lower loss. But 35 ohms can handle more, more power, and but you want to have low loss and handle. So they they kind of settled on 50 as a compromise. And you know, you can, and like you said, you can make wire feed lines just about any impedance you want. So kind of a related question um, is boils down to: Can antenna efficiency be measured? knowing that the SWR is, talks about how much reflection is going on uh, and you want to have the whole system be um, minimize the reflections. Can you, can you, you can't measure antenna efficiency with an SWR meter. Is there some way to measure it? You need a power meter. Um... Yeah, Ten. there is, but it's not with an SWR bridge. All right. that just tells you is the match. You need to be able to actually measure currents and or power. And once again, it's not trivial. I mean, uh, we did that quite a bit when I worked at LS Research, but we, we were using um, basically antennas that were calibrated with known gains and whatever, and we would we, we were able to calculate or estimate or, or have knowledge of those antennas efficiency from the basics of the design of those antennas and they were reference antennas. And then we compared the antennas that we were designing at LS to the reference antennas. And if they were 3 dB poor, that meant they were only half as efficient as an antenna. Uh, not a trivial pursuit, <laughs> that's for sure. Use a light bulb. Well, lipo will show you a good way to say that you're getting power of the light bulb, but but then replace it from the antenna. You know, the antenna is going to be completely different. Yeah, the light bulb will just show you that you have some kind of energy there, I guess. And but we we used all the expensive test equipment that a, a business was able to pay for to to do that. And we were able to result, you know, after uh, measurements against standard antennas, able to come up with how much, how, how efficient the antenna worked and actually calculate those numbers. But it was not a plug and play operation whatsoever. And you're there, you're, you're by efficiency, you're looking for maximum gain. You know, if you didn't, if you wanted an antenna that, like a, like a fixed antenna that radiated in all directions and you wouldn't necessarily want the gain, but when I mean, you could lose some, I mean, you don't want to make your antenna out of nichrome wire because, you know, the currents flowing are just going to get converted to heat. So if you use a good conductor and wider conductors, you know, you'll have less losses from that standpoint. But really probably the big thing is caused by mismatching the load and 
and your your antenna system. I mean, even if you have a, a perfectly good antenna, perfectly resonant, if you got crappy coax and long coax, you're going to lose a lot of your power. If you have three dB loss, you've lost half your power. Well, Gary, you touched on one other thing when you were talking about your vertical antennas, and efficiency really plays into that with a poor ground system chewing up yeah. most of your transmitter power. And that's, I mean, the antenna may look real good on an SWR bridge, as you said, and it may actually sound like you're hearing signals, but uh, you might, when you go to transmit, put 100 watts into it and really only end up with 10 watts radiating out into the, uh, you know, out to space. So you, you're 10 dB down uh, or 10 per, I guess that would be the same as your antenna is 10% efficient than that's because the other 90% is getting eaten up in that poor ground system. But uh, you you just kind of touched on that, of course, and yeah. that, that's a big part of efficiency there. Yeah, Tyrell raised his hand with just one more question and we we'll probably get back to the meeting. Oh yeah, just a quick one, uh, probably a much simpler question. Uh, but um, so I want to stick up a vertical side of my house here, like, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 feet from the house, 30 feet, I don't know, not that far. Um, I was wondering, uh, um, uh, aluminum siding, gutters, uh, those kinds of things, those are all like metal things. I, I, I learned about the, well, the phased arrays for verticals. That's kind of interesting ideas. You can switch them or have three or four of them, but then you can also do passive ones or you have an antenna that's a little bit longer or kind of longer or shorter that also change it. Does a uh, aluminum siding does that actually mess it up does it push it one way or not or it's what going it to depend on, on the frequency how far you are away the size of the uh the, you know, the, the wall um it it's 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 not going to be a trivial thing to know generally you want to keep your antennas away from other metal objects because rarely does things get improved because you got some random piece of metal nearby is, is there like a magic number, like more than a quarter wavelength away or something or, you know, I mean, uh, as far as possible. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, but you if do you go what too you far, can, you know, you do right. what you can. I if think too past... far, your cable comes into play, right? Yeah. What's that? If you go too far, then your coax comes into play because now you've got yeah. hundred feet of coax instead of 50 or whatever. Pat's got a good saying. What is it about the stuff doesn't have to be exact or ham radio wouldn't exist. What was that that you said, Pat? Well, if if any of this stuff had to be exact, we we wouldn't have ham radio because it never would have been invented in the first place. So you just basically put it up and you try it and you see what works. And yep, that's a good way to end this. Um, we'll, we'll have a breakout room. We can talk about any other questions after the meeting. So let's hold the questions right there, okay. and we will have the uh, the breakout room afterwards. Thank you, Gary. Very interesting. Thank you. And just one comment. I, I seem to recall that that impedance of free space thing is theoretical and um, not that it that it's actually not a real uh, physical device, because if it was a, an actual physical constant, you would heat up free space because it would absorb energy. Uh, it's, it has something to do with expressing Maxwell's equations, but that was many, many years ago. So 